now for a GB News exclusive. Following senior figures in Westminster finding their mobile phone numbers shared and unsolicited flirtatious messages sent to their personal phones, GB News has today been given exclusive access to the Westminster Honeypot messages. First, this is how the honey trap worked. A message would be sent pretending to have known the recipient. In this instance, an account identifying itself as Charlie said, was sad not to bump into you over conference season. It's been too long. This was followed up by the flirtatious message, do I need to do something better to grab your attention? Now, GB News understands messages were sent over a period spanning five months. Here we see persistent messages. Hey, how are you? Sorry, accident. Hey, hey, we not going to pick this up then? Now, we understand that well over a dozen figures in Westminster have been targeted in this way. But just to repeat, this is how they were targeted. Hmm. So from an unknown number, someone out of the blue drops a line to an MP or a political journalist saying, oh, saw you around, nice to bump into you, how are you, whatever. No response, continues, 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 continues. Now, I don't know about you, Tom, mm. but when I get a message out of the blue from an unknown number, I am automatically suspicious. Yeah. I automatically feel, you know what, I'm probably not going to respond to that. At best, I'd probably say, who's this? And if there's no pr adequate response, then you just ignore and block. But what we're seeing here is that potentially... Are politicians who are supposed to be sensible, who are given training on what to avoid and not to look foolish, have actually responded and indulged messages like this and potentially shared indecent images? That's right. The Times is saying that two members of Parliament have shared indecent images uh, in this way. And uh, it's easy to see, looking at the content of these messages, how they could have done that, thinking that this is someone that they might have met, might have known. The way in which these messages are written certainly is designed to Oh, but come on, to, as an uh, MP, as an MP, probably you should leave sending indecent photos in the past. If you're mm. a public figure, why on earth, why on earth would you share a picture of yourself in a compromising with position. Someone I mean, with someone you don't know you're talking to. I mean, to. seriously. Is... And then William Ragg, apparently so scared that someone could, you know, share photos of him, that he would then pass colleagues' numbers. Yes, although there, the reason William Ragg has not had the whip withdrawn from him mm. is he, he's also being considered to some extent as a victim in this at this stage. But let's discuss this. Yes, the police a bit investigation further. is looking at the who was trying to target him rather than him doing anything yes. illegal. But let's get more with our GB News political editor, Christopher Hope. Uh, Christopher, this is a, a pretty shocking story that is rippling through Westminster. That's right. Hi, Tom. Hi, Emily. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, it's been taken very, very seriously by the Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. He wrote to MPs uh, last night. Um, I've got the letter here in my hand. It says here that the Parliamentary Security Department is working closely with partners in government, who I understand to be security experts, to analyse and understand the nature of these messages and any related security risk. And he would stress that it's unwise to speculate about their origin at this stage. Clearly, there is a concern it could be a foreign state actor targeting MPs who may be uh, prone to responding to messages. We know William Ragg um, has had uh, mental health issues in the past. He's been open about those issues, talked about them, um, has had lots of um, sympathy from other MPs. Uh, Early today, um, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, had this to say about Mr Ragg. Well, I think the events of the last few days uh, have been a great cause for concern. Uh, the MP involved has given a courageous and fulsome apology. But the lesson here for all MPs is that they need to be very careful about cyber security. And indeed, it's the lesson for members of the public as well, because this, this is something that we are all having to face in our daily lives. That's Jeremy Hunt there talking about uh, William Ragg. Now, William Ragg, I understand, is in Greater Manchester in his constituency. 
He's, he'll be spoken to this afternoon by those experts in Parliament and government to understand how many other numbers he gave out, um, a, a dozen or so. I also understand from senior sources, sources that more are coming forward as we speak. Uh, so this issue is growing, not subsiding. Chris, it seems to me that Jeremy Hunt was very generous there, saying that he gave a courageous and fulsome apology. I mean, this is an MP who has been handing out his colleagues' numbers, potentially bringing Parliament into disrepute. I'm sure a lot of people would consider that perhaps this would be a matter to take away the whip from him. Why do you suppose there's so much uh, generosity from the likes of Hunt? I think it's because, Emily, he's, he's well known, he's liked in Parliament, he's a senior Tory MP, Vice Chairman of the 1922 Committee. He did issue a statement last night to the Times in which he said um, he, they've had some compromising things on me, they wouldn't leave me alone, I've hurt people by being weak, I was scared, I'm mortified, I'm so sorry my weakness has caused other people hurt. He's made very clear that it was a weak moment. I mean, I think everyone is subject to this pressure and how we deal with it is up to us. And some people find it harder to resist um, pressure. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I mean, he, he found himself giving out details he never should have done to random strangers. That's clearly totally wrong. I think Jeremy Hunt was allowing himself to see the human behind uh, this issue. And William Ragg has, has, has had time off from Parliament to deal with mental health issues. He's, that's well known by MPs. And I think that's Jeremy Hunt trying to say, we understand he's, uh, he's under pressure and he has, he has said sorry. But you're right when you said there the advice is always don't respond to uh, unsolicited text messages. It could be anybody trying to get in touch. Um, as I understand it, sources tell me, very senior sources in the Commons say, it looks unlikely this was a foreign actor, but as I say, the, the Commons authorities are using all the uh, assets in the state um, um, to, to examine whether it was uh, a, 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 comp a country trying to exploit uh, weak Tory MPs. Or, or MPs at all. Mm, well, very interesting indeed. Thank you, Christopher Hope, our political editor. Well, let's get some more on this with the thoughts of political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal. Uh, James, just how many people do we think this might have affected? Well, you mentioned there, Tom, at the beginning of the programme, about a dozen or so. Uh, I've heard a similar number. And I think what's quite striking, it wasn't just, of course, con uh, MPs, Conservative MPs. There's also uh, other people involved at different levels uh, in Parliament, staff members as well. So this was an attempt to kind of really um, sort of put out there sort of machine gun approach, different uh, different types of um, people out there. And it wasn't just uh, parliamentarians who might have had access to more sensitive stuff, but also people lower down the food chain in Westminster as well. Uh, James, do we understand that it was only uh, male MPs that were targeted? And what does that say about them? Well, I, my understanding is that I've only heard of, of men being targeted by this. Um, perhaps this shows perhaps uh, the way in which men were seen as more likely targets for these kind of uh, attempted honey trapping involvements. Uh, traditionally, it's men and male politicians in Westminster. You go back through the past 50, 100 years or so throughout the Cold War who were targeted in these kind of things. Um, but also, I think perhaps uh, a level of the predominance of Westminster is men as well. So um, I think perhaps you know choosing the effective targets, looking at sort of honey trapping history, uh, and hearing the names that have been involved in all this kind of stuff, uh, also point to more male involvement in this than women. Now, of course, there's a long history in Westminster, as you allude to, of honey traps by foreign state actors. In this instance. It, it, perhaps it's not a foreign state actor, perhaps it is, but it could be uh, someone trying to extort people for money, for influence, or even for sexual gratification. Absolutely, and as you say, Tom, there's a whole history of that. I've just uh, finished reading uh, Closet Queen, which is a great book about sort of um, homosexuals in politics previously. And there's a case, for instance, when Robert Boothby in the 1960s was blackmailed by the Cray twins. Uh, that was one case where there was a criminal element, a domestic criminal element involved there. Obviously, maybe some of you have seen last year the John Stonehouse documentary in which he was blackmailed by Eastern Bloc agents. He was a Labour MP in the 1970s. So foreign state actors, but also domestic actors as well, are involved in this. There's also cases where, you know, you get kind of um, domestic rows and things like that, and people's own partners get involved for kind of own sexual gratification. We don't know more. I'm sure more de details will emerge uh, over the coming weeks or so. But it's a reminder yet again of the importance of cyber security. Uh, and coming at a time when the UK government, I know, is preparing uh, things like the Defending Democracy Task Force, 
for the kind of national elections to ensure they can't be targeted by foreign state actors. It's a reminder that it can be as simple as passing on a known phone number to someone else. That can also lead to the downfall of people's careers and lots of shame and ignominy as well. I mean, this could ha do potential damage to people's personal relationships if some of these MPs who have been involved in these conversations with these numbers potentially sending pictures and the like, and if they happen to be married or have children and things, this could be, this could have huge ramifications, couldn't it, for some of these MPs, potentially? Absolutely. And I think it leads on to an interesting debate about changing norms involving our MPs and blackmail. I think in this case, Will Rag has made a miscalculation. And I think you've seen there from Jeremy Hunt's comments about uh, how courageous this statement was. I think actually what Will Rag could have done was just you know be honest about the fact that he had these these pictures were out there and the messages, et cetera, um, because people don't think, I don't think they care as much as they used to. Um, and I think that's about changing norms around social media, but also he was a victim of this. And I think that was a mistake. I'm not actually think that people would immediately sympathize with him on this because, uh, you know, I think this stuff is going to be more and more of a feature of political life over the next 10, 20 years or so. Uh, and we want to try and learn the lessons of this. And, you know, if people are getting blackmailed to go to the police straight away uh, and point this out, because obviously it's clearly not on, it's illegal uh, and needs to be stamped out of public life. Yes, it seems that sometimes people try and control it themselves and in mm. doing so actually spread it out into further things. Although, James, just finally, I suppose if William Ragg didn't hand out these phone numbers, people could have got members of Parliament's phone numbers through any sort of means. Yeah, absolutely. And there's still quite a lot of information about MPs and their residences in terms of electoral law, actually, on online and offline as well. And mm. um, there are things. I think it just shows that, again, Westminster needs to make sure it's being very careful yeah. in its use of information uh, and to ensure that we kind of minimise these sort of leaks uh, as much as possible. Well, James Hill, political correspondent at The Spectator, thank you very much for your time. Surely he could have gone to, you know, the parliamentary party, gone to a colleague, gone to the whip yeah. and actually, yeah. yeah. What the whips are I mean, it's so foolish. Yeah. So, so foolish.